Today, you are listening to Think Again Christian, where pop culture and Christian traditions collide with biblical truth. Sponsored by Rainier Christian Schools. And now your host, pastor of Ravensdale Bible Church and superintendent of Rainier Christian Schools, Tony Jamie. Rethinking and re-examining concepts, ideas, traditions, and challenging your beliefs from anywhere from American pop culture uh, to your Christian denominational circles. How? By the renewing of your mind. Well, I grew up in the suburbs of, of Los Angeles, and, and if you're standing in the heart of L.A. and you're looking up at the, the Hollywood sign, I would have grown up in a town called Glendale, California, right over the D of the Hollywood sign and kind of nestled in the what's called the, the San Fernando Valley where me and 1.8 million of my friends um, rolled around in 120 degree heat in the summer and uh, really enjoyed living there and growing up there and um, still, you know, th- th- that's home. One of the cool things about the San Fernando Valley was it was you know, it was an old farmland. It was, it was, it was a part of the basin where, where people planted a lot of, of citrus trees, a lot, a lot of orchards. And, and what's funny is you go into the, to the row housing, you know, and the developments and, and, and you'll still see in like almost every single person's backyard, some kind of, of citrus tree. Uh, they weren't replanted. They were just there. They, they kind of left them and you'll still even go buy some lots and, and see, you know, a, a little grove of, of, of citrus trees. Now, it didn't take a, you know, a, a horticulturist, you know, or some kind of tree expert for, for us to figure out what, what kind of tree, uh, you know, was in our backyard. Now, we didn't run any tests, you know, we didn't have, you know, send in the sample of the fruit, you know, to the scientists. Um, it, it was... It was pretty simple. You know, the, the, the tree bared witness of itself. I mean, two easy realities. Number one, the, you know, the tree was full of fruit. I mean, it had fruit on it. And number two, the fruit was probably colored. And, you know, if it were yellow fruit and then a little ball, then it was a lemon tree. And if it were an orange tree and, or a little orange ball, it was an orange tree. By the way, I always wonder about that. Well, you know, where do you come up with the word lemon, right? And then, you know, for an orange tree, the best they could do is it's orange. So we'll just call it orange. Uh, reminds me of the Stanford Cardinal. You know, they don't, they don't have a nickname. It's just a color. It's not even plural. Kind of, kind of weird. Well, you know, that's easy, right? It's, it's not very confusing. You look at the tree. The tree has fruit. The description of the tree is pretty easy. And, and, and well, this, this is the kind of simple, plain example that, that God uses when describing False prophets from genuine ones or real Christians from, from fake ones. I'm often asked questions about, you know, my personal uh, theological positions, you know, especially, you know, people knowing that I've been to seminary and studied the Bible and, and, and they want to know, well, what position do you take? Like, like, are you a Calvinist or are you an Arminian? Uh, do you believe that, you know, once saved, always saved or that you can lose your salvation? And I always answer the same way, and it's not because I'm avoiding the question, and it's not because I I don't have an opinion. It's actually because I went to seminary with with some of these things really intent in mind was to, I am going to come out of seminary clearly defined as as identifying myself as a Calvinist Arminian. But what I discovered was was that when people ask me this, this question, I've come to the conclusion that, well, was Jesus a Calvinist or was Jesus an Arminian? I've never had anybody answer me that because, well, we know the answer to that. He he was neither. But seriously, I mean, when did our denominal labels trump simple biblical truth? So, so we think of the illustration of the fruit tree. If, if you drive by, yellow means lemon, red means apple, purple, plums, and who would confuse avocado for walnuts or olives for pomegranates? Have you ever seen, you know, a boot, a, a hat, a hammer, you know, a coffee mug, or or a book, you know, hanging in the 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 book tree, right? 
Well, so what does this have to do with that that question, you know, um, Calvin versus Arminius? Well, we're called to be Christians, not Calvinists, not Arminians, Christians. That means we're we're called to follow Christ. Uh, we're, we're called to be Biblicists. We're, we're called to be sola scriptura. So I ask the questions that the Bible asks, and I answer the questions the Bible answers, and I yield and conform to issues like once saved, always saved, by, by turning to Scripture, not based on theology books or commentaries that were written by men who copied other men. That was one of the things that was kind of shocking to me in, in seminary, is all, all of a sudden what you do is you, you, you start with the Bible and you say, okay, let's you know, go read this commentary. And you read the commentary and they come up with some kind of comment, ergo commentary, and you go, where did the guy get that idea from? And then you find out, oh, well, he got it from another commentary. And then you go back to the next commentary and go, when he got it from another commentary. Essentially what happens is you end up getting a guy sitting down with his Bible. He doesn't know how to answer that question any better than you do. Now, maybe he studied it a long time and he takes his best shot. I mean, do you realize as brilliant as John Calvin was? And believe me, he was brilliant at 21 years old. He, 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 he wrote his institutes and it's a, it's a magnificent piece, but he's one man. I have the benefit of not only reading and studying his stuff, but everybody else is after and everybody's commentary after I forgive me. I don't mean this to be arrogant, but I have way more knowledge, way more information. And so does the normal Christian with the internet than he did. And, and, and so again, we, you know, we have to be careful to say, well, what does the Bible say? You know, one of my favorite questions, are you, you know, Pre-trib, post-trib, you know, is Jesus coming before, in the middle, or after? It's not brain surgery. They asked Jesus the same question. What did Jesus say? I don't know. Only the Father knows. Now think about that for a half a second. Jesus says, I don't know. And we've got men writing 300-page books saying, I know. Does, does that not scare you just a little bit? It scares me. Um, and then I go back to listen. I, 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 I glean from godly men who've, who've poured their lives into studying maybe one subject and, and I, and there's value to that. Don't, don't get me wrong. But first and foremost is, is, is we go to the, to the clear, clear verses in the Bible that are very straightforward. And one of them is the statement, well, you will know them by their fruit. Well, begs the question, what does that mean? So the real question shouldn't be, do you believe like once saved, always saved? Do you believe in backsliding? Do you believe in carnal Christianity? The question is, where's your fruit? We clearly, clearly know that God is sovereign over all things. We know God picks and chooses. We know God elects and saves his people, but we don't have his Rolodex. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't have the book of life in our library shelf, do we? Um, so, so how do I evaluate, we'll make it personal. How do I evaluate my 17 year old son? Is he saved? He may not be able to dictate a, you know, a, a beautiful go gospel presentation or debate with an atheist. So, so how do I know? How, how do I know? Well, I look at his fruit. I don't need a, a, a fruit tree to speak a dissertation. It doesn't explain to me why it's a grapefruit tree. And why it's not a fig tree. It simply fills its branches with big, ripe grapefruits or figs. You see, the, the fruit is there just, just by observation. And so again, I, I look at the example of, of my son and, you know, we've been able to have some, some amazing conversations lately. And the irony is it is, is it doesn't come down to a, a, a one time momentary event. Well, we, we want on a short-term mission trip to Mexico. He must be a Christian. Or, 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 or he goes to church every Sunday. He must be a Christian. He, he doesn't cuss. So he must be a Christian. Well, a, a, a better barometer of that really, honestly, would be having somebody walk by him all day long, just watch and observe him, and the Bible would say, you know what? We should be able to tell just by watching his normal day activity 
whether he's a believer or not. Not not because of one thing, but because of the body of work. Where is his fruit? Where is the fruit? Is it one one orange hanging on a tree that would then define that as a as an orange tree? Well, what if that tree was was filled with with black boots? There's, there's black boots everywhere, and there's one orange. Do do we would we call that a an orange tree or a black boot tree? And so it's really not that complicated. And if we and if we think about it, if we think about the simplicity of what God's trying to tell us, what He's saying is, look at what you see, and and, and what you see isn't a momentary response. It's the body of work. So another example is my 17 year old son. And we, you know, we want him to make his bed, take out the trash, you know, bring in the firewood, you know, take care of the chickens, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, if you've ever had a teenage boy, you, you probably already know where I'm going with this. So, you know, you have that heart to heart. These are, this is what you do as part of the family. And if you love the family, if you're part of the family, you know, I've laid it out. You know what to do. You know what the expectations are. Now go do it. And, you know, for, I don't know, I guess, you know, five years now, we, we just dance this dance until they move out, right? I, you know, and what that dance is, is one week goes along and they do everything you say they're going to do. And then all of a sudden things start to slip. They do well in some areas and not in the other. And week comes by and we give them a little upgrade and they, they do well and not. And, and so at the end of the day, what we want to see is, well, does he really participate in doing this from his own, from his own heart, or, or or do we have to mandate it? Do we have to post signs? Do we have to have punishments? The real fruit we see then would be in the obedience of of just doing it. You don't have to ask mom and dad to do that stuff, right? We all just do it. So when we come back, we'll take a closer look at where is your fruit. Since their small beginnings in 1963, the ministry of Rainier Christian Schools has been dedicated to educating and developing each of their students for the glory of God. And it's more than just a school. Rainier Christian Schools is actually an entire school district, with three schools serving the areas of Kent, Auburn, Covington, Renton, and Maple Valley. The Christ-centered environment weaves God's truth through everything they do, from top-notch academics all the way through their competitive sports programs. Learn more at RainierCSD.org or call 425-255-7273. That's 425-255-7273. Contact Rainier Christian Schools today. Welcome back. You're listening to Think Again Christian, sponsored by Rainier Christian Schools. And now your host, Tony Jamie. Where is your fruit? Well, we're looking at the concept that we we find in Matthew 7, which describes the, the example that that God gives us of looking at, you know, the difference between a false prophet and a wolf in sheep's clothing. And, and the concept and the idea there as well, a, um, a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And so the idea then is you will know them by their fruit. And so the question is, where is, where is your fruit? I've been wrestling with this, uh, for a while now, because one of the issues that keeps coming up in our uber postmodern world is that this has so infiltrated the church, so infiltrated uh, Christians and, and Christian thought. And, and, and that idea plays out in, you know, well, we, we, we really question, we question everything now. So really, when we go to the Bible, we don't go to the Bible to, to, to yield and to to be taught by God, we we don't go to the Bible to to be conformed to to what what God would have us by by the renewing of our mind. Instead, we go to the Bible to prove what we already believe, or we go to the Bible to 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 disprove what we don't want to to hear. I I don't want to hear that I have to wait, you know, for 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 intercourse before I get married. So I'm going to try to find a verse in the Bible that's going to, you know, show me some wiggle room. We'll, we'll see, see David committed adultery and, and God didn't strike him with the lightning bolt and, and he's in heaven. So I guess that means I can. 
right? Well, we, we've grown now to just question everything. And, and I'm not talking about the not being a good Berean. And, and you know, we want to be good Bereans. We, we want to study the scriptures in depth. But what, what we've come to now is these, these philosophies. You know, if it feels good, do it. You know, have fun, right? Just, you know, live life. And, and there's no real objective truth. So evaluating good fruit and, and bad fruit really has, has no value. And, and you know what? The idea then seeps in, well, I, I can do some good things and, and, you know, have a cluster, you know, a little cluster of good fruit. Um, yeah, you know, everybody sins, right? We're all sinners. And there becomes this acceptance. And, and Romans talks about this and says, no, may it never be. Don't, don't, don't think like that. You know, the Bible stands for something. You know, we've, we've redefined the idea of judging. I mean, you do a poll of most Christians. Is it okay to judge? Yes or no? I would venture to say that most would say, no, of course it's not okay to judge. And yet that's not what the Bible teaches us in Matthew. So what it teaches us is, look, you, there is a judgment and, and you, the rod, the standard of that judgment is God's word. And so, of course, I can rightly say, look, you're, you're, you're not allowed to, to worship false idols. You're not allowed to commit adultery. You're not allowed to steal. Absolutely, I can judge you in that and hold myself to the same standard. And so when I look at this concept of where is your fruit, where is your fruit? A few weeks ago, I was reading Matthew 7, and, and, and it, was, you know, it was about the, the narrow and the wide gates. And, and as a way of, of looking at genuine believers from, from false ones, this passage you know, kind of uses th- three pictures, a, a narrow gate, false prophets, um, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and, and fruit. And so it begins with the idea of the, of the, of the narrow versus the wide gate. And they, you know, most people are going to go the easy route. Most people are going to go with, with the crowd. Most people are going to go through the, the wide gate, you know, not the Robert Frost, take the road less traveled, the, but the, but the wide gate, very common, but yet it's the, the narrow gate that Matthew seven says, that's the gate that leads to life. So by definition, if, if, if you take a look around and you're in the longest line at the fair, you're in the wrong line. If, if you're going towards the, the opening that, that is big and wide and, and has the most people, you, you're, you're in the wrong crowd. That's what, what God's trying to illustrate here. And you'll know, take a look and, and reevaluate. It goes on to talk about this idea of false pro- prophets. And false pro- prophets hide themselves. The sad part of it is they don't, they don't just come to you straightforward. Hey, I have a different idea. I know it's going to sound crazy, but this is what I've been. No, no, no. They, they hide themselves. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're sneaky. They're deceptive. This is why lies and deceit um, are, are, are so powerful and so dangerous because they're cunning. Nobody thinks of a, of a wolf as being, oh, cute little sweet wolves. They're so neat. No, you, you think of them as, as thieves. You think of them as scoundrels. Unlike a lion, you say, all right, yeah, he goes out hunting. He's bigger, stronger, faster, and he wins. Good for him. So how do we know who goes through the wide gates? How do we know the false prophet? How do we know a wolf is near? Well, we know this by their fruit. That's, that's the whole point. As Matthew continues in Matthew seven sixteen, it is is saying, you will know a wolf or you will know a false prophet by, by the body of work, by their fruit. A bad tree will produce bad fruit. And likewise, a good tree produces good fruit. Verse 19 says that, that trees that don't bear good fruit. Now, now remember, this, this is the Bible. This isn't me. And, and take off your denominational viewpoint, your your theology for a second, and just listen to what verse 19 is saying. It's saying, trees that don't bear good fruit are cut down and thrown into the fire. So you're saying, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a tree. I'm in. I'm good. I'm solid. I'm, I'm part of the team. Yeah. But if you don't bear good fruit, you're going to get cut down. And, and this is what's frightening to me, because I, I, I immediately I think of the grafting process in Romans. I think, okay, 
So he's going to do some pruning and grafting. And I just think of, of God as, you know, kind of like Mr. Miyagi, you know, sitting there with the little, with the little bonsai tree. And you know what? Maybe you're having a bad patch right now and he's taking a look at you and he snips you off. But he puts you on the side there, the table, and he's just, you know, biding his time until he, he you know, wires you back in. Okay, I, I can hang with that. Except the problem here is it says the bad fruit gets cut down and then thrown into the fire. You know, when we go out in the backyard and, and, and we burn our, our leaves and our branches, you know what happens about an hour later? There's nothing left. It's just ash. There's no regrafting. There's no putting it back into the tree. It's done. Verse 21 goes on to suggest that many in the church, frightening, many in the church think that they're entering the narrow gate because they have some fruit. They say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I perform miracles? Have you performed a miracle lately? Mark, have you performed any miracles lately? Because, you know, I would be impressed. If, If you could perform a miracle, I would definitely say Mark is saved forever He's in the kingdom of God. There's no way. I've seen it with my eyes, right? I mean, what more proof do you need? And, and God's sitting here going, plenty of people are going to look at me and say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. They think because they have clusters of fruit that, that they're okay, but they're not. One of my biggest concerns working with kids at at Rainier Christian schools is that they think that because they're, they hear Christian sermons, that they have Christian parents, that they quote verses, that can answer Bible questions and, and have some fruits, you know, maybe they've done some little outreach or mission activities that, that they're okay. And yet, Lord, Lord haunts me. I never knew you. Where is your fruit? I have some pieces. Do you realize, do you realize, and I'm dating myself here. Do you realize that Charles Manson Loves his mommy. Charles Manson loves his mommy too. M- murders, you know, they can do nice things every now and then too. Adolf Hitler, he liked kids. Had a whole, you know, children's program going on in, in Germany. You know, he liked kids. And they're not all that bad, right? Evil, wicked, bad people are capable of doing good acts. But when you watch them, when you know them, when you know them, their tree, it's evident by the fruit that they produce. An orange tree can only pretend to be a grapefruit tree for, for so long. As you get closer, it doesn't look quite right. It, it, that, that, that ball is, is, is bigger when I get closer. It, it's not the right color. It, 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 it doesn't smell right. It, it, it doesn't taste right. And so the danger of promoting things like character traits, you know, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control is... Well, you can practice some of these traits, but a real fruit tree is revealed and manifested from these these fruits. The fruit of the Spirit pours out of your life. And so the reason I found myself in Matthew 7 came from the frustration of watching so many people I know claim to be fruit trees and yet bear no fruit or look more like a ravenous wolf in sheep's clothing. And there's a real danger in the church that that believes every tree is fine or will be forgiven. And Matthew seven nineteen clearly warns us that those trees will be cut off and thrown into the fire that have and bear bad fruit. So before you go to bed tonight, ask yourself, where is my fruit? So think again, Christian. You've been listening to Think Again, Christian, sponsored by Rainier Christian Schools and Tony Jamie. Rainier Christian Schools serves preschool through high school with three locations in the Renton, Maple Valley, Covington, Kent, and Auburn areas. For more information about Rainier Christian Schools, www.rainiercsd.org or call 425-255-7273.